For over 40 years, the Sundance Film Festival has been held on the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Shoshone, Paiute, Gojute, and Ute tribal nations. We do land acknowledgments to recognize the traditional stewards of this land and our 500 years of resistance to ongoing colonialism. But can we acknowledge the land without listening to the land? Take a moment to really listen. From the Ute to the Wet'suwet'en, from the Anishinaabe to the Kingdom of Hawaii, indigenous nations all over the world understand that the land does not belong to us. We belong to the land. And we continue to fight for her. Let this land acknowledgement move you beyond symbolic recognition. Let it be your call to action. Support indigenous resistance. Join us in the fight to protect our mother, for our human and non-human kin, for the next seven generations. Welcome to the Sundance Film Festival. My name is Jilcia Barrera. I'm a programmer for the festival, and it's my honor to introduce today's Cinema Cafe presented by Audible. Our special guests today are Karen Gillen and Emma Thompson. Please do not miss the opportunity to watch their films here at Sundance. Karen is the lead in dual screening in our US dramatic competition. And Emma is the star of Good Luck to You, Leo Grand in our premiere section. Both films are extremely amazing and we're so proud to present them. And of course, we would like to thank Shirley Lee for moderating this morning. Shirley is a journalist based in Los Angeles where she covers culture as a staff writer for The Atlantic. Her writing has appeared in Entertainment Weekly, Wired, and Sports Illustrated. We're so thankful to have her with us today. Please do not forget, we have other conversations taking place here throughout the week. I encourage you to check out our schedule on our website. And again, thank you all for joining us. And now I will hand it over to Shirley. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be moderating this discussion with Karen Gillen and Emma Thompson. Welcome, both of you. And thank you so much for being here today. Karen and Emma, congratulations on both of your clever and layered films at the festival this year. Let's dive right in. Hello. 
Hello. Tech, tech City. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Holding, waiting for your videos. <laughs> yes. I like to keep people waiting just a little bit. <laughs> it's so exciting. I'm going to press a button. <laughs> oh, whoa. First so of easy. all. <laughs> Hello, everyone tuning in. And Karen and Emma, thank you so much for joining. I was like, oh, God, they got cold feet. They're leaving. <laughs> I'll just talk to myself <laughs> for an hour. Um, well, let's dive right in. So on the surface, uh, your films aren't very similar at all. I'll just say, uh, Karen, your film Duel is about a woman who learns she has an incurable disease and opts to have a clone of herself made so she can live on after death. While Emma, your film, Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, is about a woman meeting up with a sex worker to turn her sex life around. There is a clear connection to me, I'll just say. Both of these projects are about socially awkward women paying for unusual services, uh, but we'll get back to that. I like to begin by asking what drew you to these stories. So Emma, I'm going to start with you. Uh, I know that you've worked before with the writer of Leo Grand in the, in the second Nanny McPhee, uh, but you've also played a lot of romantic heroines in your career. Uh, you know, you've played the classic Jane Austen heroine in Sense and Sensibility, uh, the, the spurned wife in Love Actually, uh, you know, you were in a tale of unrequited love and remains of the day. I could go on and on. Uh, I would argue that your character in Leo Grand is an unusual romantic heroine, but a romantic heroine nonetheless. And I wonder what draws you to such characters and such stories about the way we love and find love. I'm interested to hear you say that, Shirley. I actually disagree with you. Um, I don't think that my character in Leo Grand is romantic, and I think that's what makes it so interesting, because it presents as something that might lead you to think it's going to be some sort of love story, but actually it's not a love story, but it, it is about intimacy, um, and it's not romantic in that sense. Their connection um, the two characters in this film, and there's only two characters. And Karen, I haven't seen your movie. I can't wait to see it. I only read about it because um, I've, I've not had access to it, obviously, because it's not been available. So I haven't seen it. So I can't wait to see it. It sounds absolutely fascinating. Anyway, just to say. Um, but, um, um, yeah, so so I don't think of Nancy as a romantic heroine. I think of her much more um, in classical terms as a searcher, as someone who has led um, a very um, restricted life and has ticked all the boxes and got into all the shapes that women are required to get into in order to pass, you know, as people who can be acceptable in society. Um, and one of the things that's not very acceptable about women is that they should have appetites of any kind. Um, so it's very easy for her to have been repressed. Um, and then she chooses suddenly to um, un unleash herself, un uh, unzip herself. Mm -hmm. um, so the romance, if anything, is is with herself. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really glad that you you disagree because I was wondering what you thought about that. So she's less of a romantic heroine, more of a repressed heroine. <laughs> Maybe that's a better descriptor. Uh, Karen, similar question for you. Uh, you know, in your career, you've played in a lot of sci-fi or tech centric arenas, whether, you know, that's doing some timey wimey business on Doctor Who or taking selfies on selfie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here you are in Duel playing a woman and her clone, her evil clone. Uh, what draws you again and again to this genre, this arena? God, that's a really good question. I feel like it, it seeks me out in a way. Um, and for me, I'm sort of like, I do enjoy different genres, but in a weird way, like the genre can be irrelevant because Ultimately, I'm just looking for a good story, whether that's on Earth or in space or anywhere, um, and a good character to play. Um, and actually, I find some pretty interesting characters within this sort of more sci-fi genre. Although Jewel is, um, is an interesting one because it's got elements of sci-fi, but it's not really... I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's satirical. It's a bit of a yeah. thriller. It's also a black comedy. It's mm -hmm. Emma. You've got to see. It. You you have to see it. Um, no, no, I love sci-fi as well. I absolutely love it, and I just think I think it's so prophetic. Often, don't you, Karen? It's really 
you know, from from when I was young, sci-fi really saw ahead. You know, it just sees things. Um, and the great sci-fi we've lived with for ages, from Blade Runner onwards, from Philip K. Dick, from all of those, Ray Bradbury, all of those extraordinary writers. And now you look at it and go, this is all absolutely happening and could be possible. It's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Well, I want to zoom in a little bit more and talk about these roles in particular uh, and go back to when you first read the script, you know, a classic question. What about your specific characters sparked your interest in this story, you know, that, that hooked you and made you know you wanted to be a part of these respective projects? You know, was there a particular character quirk or a line? Uh, Emma, I'll start with you again because Nancy has some incredible lines that I don't think I can repeat here. <laughs> I don't, she, she doesn't I don't think there's anything you can't repeat but anyway well um the script came to me via Katie Brand who um is a wonderful wonderful writer I don't know if you know but she's also written a book about dirty dancing and about the fact that this was one of the first movies to address abortion and it's a pro-abortion movie that you know is not really recognized it's just the most incredible achievement for its day so she's very in she's a massively intelligent writer and person and um she she wrote this script sent it to me and said look i wrote this with you in mind and you know what do you think and i read it and immediately just wrote back and said, you have to make this because it was one of those full blown things that was whole and living and didn't need to be. I mean, she and Sophie and me and that we all worked a little bit, of course, but um, it was such a fantastically well written piece and the characters so well realized and the situation so it, unique, I'd never seen anything like it. And I'd never seen a character like Nancy coming out of her sort of shires. I mean, you and I know these women so well, Karen. These are women from the British Isles who, you know, just don't um, live their lives according to the rules. And then suddenly find that the rules have not served them, have not served them emotionally, have not served them physically, have not served their, their sense of themselves as people in the world, but have in fact just locked them into um, a, a sort of female stereotype. And she suddenly goes, um, I need to change this. And she takes her life into her hands. And it's very courageous because what she's doing is contrary to everything she's been brought up with and indeed to her own moral structure. So she's going, she's really sort of breaking out of something. Um, and I found that completely irresistible. Yeah, Karen, same question to you. What stood out to you in the script about Sarah? Like, like Emma's saying, actually, your characters are quite similar. Sarah's also repressed in a way, and she yeah. thinks her life can only go in one direction until she gets her diagnosis. <laughs> yeah, gosh, there were so many things that really attracted me to the whole project. I would say, like, definitely the role itself was really interesting. She's a woman who, I don't think she even really enjoys living her own life. Um, she just kind of like trundles through um, and then she gets this diagnosis. She has a whole new perspective on her life. And then she has a clone made of herself and it weirdly uh, forces her to confront herself um, where, where she's kind of like, do I want to live? Is this what I want? Do I want to fight this clone in a duel to the death to take my own life back? Um, so that was kind of a really interesting journey. But then there was also the other elements of like Riley Stearns, um, the director and writer, his style is just so specific. And it was like, I remember reading it and being like, this is one of the, every line is so weirdly written. Like, it's not just like, can you pass me that cup? It'll be like a long monologue about why and how I need the cup. Um, and it was just so strange, but it's so him, it's normal to him. So that was like really interesting. I was like, how am I going to play that in a naturalistic way except it's not really naturalistic because he sort of wants everything to be really like deadpan and matter of fact and it sort of weirdly goes against all of your instincts to be like okay what's like the emotion behind this why is she doing this um and you still have to do that but the delivery he wants it to be very like matter of fact like you're not really you know trying to inject it with all of these motivations um and so that he was a bit, he sounds a bit like David Mamet, Karen. Is he a bit is it sort of Mamet like? Yeah. 
I think so. Like, it's just, yeah, I would say so. I would definitely draw some comparison there. He, it's so unique. <laughs> it was like a very, very specific experience. And I had to slot myself into his style, um, which I really wanted to take on the challenge of because it's like, okay, let me see how I, what I can bring to this. But then I would always be like, can I have a fun run where I get to do whatever I want and say whatever I want, which is completely contrary to his style. And then we ended up doing that a lot of the time. And most of the film is obviously not my fun runs. <laughs> it's his stuff. But then there's a few little moments from the fun runs. And so there was a nice little push and pull there, um, which was interesting. Did, were, were any fun runs used? You said most of them weren't, but do you remember any that did? I remember used? like some little moments, maybe like some weird little things um, in there. Mm -hmm. I, I think anyway, at least I think <laughs> they were for the fun run. <laughs> Well, I, I want to dig a little bit more into that because like, like you said, Karen, this this character kind of plays against all of your instincts, right? Everything that she says is so deadpan and explodes every yeah. little, everything is so to the point. Mm -hmm. um, I I wonder what, what helped you, uh, what was your guide, your North Star to grounding this character? I mean, this is an experience I, that's rather extraordinary. Um, I I mean, I doubt you've ever encountered your evil twin, is what I'm saying. What, what guided you to ground this character and understand her fully? I think I was sort of struggling with that a little bit before I started. Of like, how do I speak like this? And then I spent some time with Riley and I was like, I could just do an impression of you. <laughs> I don't know if he knows that. <laughs> so it's just a little bit of Riley Stearns in female form. <laughs> What's said in Cinema Cafe stays in Cinema Cafe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. I, I have to ask just to just to continue down this path a little bit more. Karen, would you opt for a replacement for a clone of yourself if faced well, in the same situation? Okay. okay. Am I dying? Am I out? Oh, um, yeah. I'm let's, dying. Let's say same situation. Uh, okay. Well, she gets the clone thinking she's about to die. So if I thought I was about to die, yes, I would get a clone to ease my parents and my dog. Um, yeah, I would do it. Hmm. Emma, I, it. I, I know you haven't seen this, but the general gist here is, you know that you have an incurable illness. Would you get a clone of yourself to survive after you? So not. <laughs> no, no, not. Why? I mean, it's, it, you know, what it sounds like as well is our, our continuation and indeed sort of to the most logical con conclusion of our resistance to death. You know, it's, um, I mean, as Nancy Mitford said many, many years ago, Americans think death is optional. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a certain truth in the way in which we're all sort of headed towards, how do we, how do we avoid it? Just avoid it. You know, let's not do it at all because it's such an unpleasant thing to have to face. And um, I think that's probably one of the reasons we're in such a terrible situation. <laughs> Now, you know, watching that first bit, the original peoples, you know, all of the land, our lessons, the next generations, it's all about the acceptance of dying and rebirth, dying and rebirth, you know. And the fact that we live certainly in generations of developed countries where people just don't want to die. And it's a form of narcissism, I think. Well, then, I'm never regretting getting a clone. I should, I shouldn't get a clone, should I? <laughs> I don't think you should, Karen, because you just don't know. You know what? The dog's going to know. Do. The dog's going to bloody know. The dog's going to go. This is smell her. This is her, and there's going to be like loads of scenes with the dog cowering in a corner with its ears <laughs> flat to the its head, like, going, "This there. is not Everything's my Karen." Right. You know. But can I get the clone <laughs> just for like? for like a 10 minute window to appear at my funeral and do a dance routine unexpectedly and then just power down. <laughs> because that would be my favorite prank as I'm going out. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> they really freak everyone out. Yeah. No, just totally freak everyone out. <laughs> So, uh, so Emma, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Nancy, a little bit more about Nancy. Um, you know, I, this is another classic question, but I'm really curious about how you inhabited her mind, because even as she's making these courageous steps to, to changing her life, she's also kind of constantly doubting herself and, and judging her choices, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I, I just wonder, you know, what helped you access her most? Female history, you know, mm -hmm. knowing about the, um, certainly in Christian society or, you know, the cultures that we live in um, and, and many other cultures, <clears throat> female pleasure is not, you know, it's not important. It's not important that women have pleasure. Um, and, you know, if you think about sex work, sex workers work, generally speaking, men buy sex. It's men who buy sex for their pleasure. And one of the reasons that that built up was because women weren't supposed to have pleasure during sex. That, that was not the idea. You know, why a Virgin Mary? So, you know, you can't have the idea that the mother of God could ever have enjoyed sex. And from that grew this terrible myth about virginity being the most important thing. And from that grew the fact that you have to have the woman controlled and her sexual pleasure must be controlled. And from that grew... You know, all of the things that have beset us in our sexual lives, which um, were by no means undone by the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution, actually, in the end, I don't think did women any favours at all. Um, I think it was just, again, more about releasing men to use women in the way that they um, <clears throat> had always done before. Um, so, I mean, there's, it's a very complicated <clears throat> area but for Nancy it's very simple she's never had an orgasm and I don't think that she's um, an unusual um, figure in modern even in modern life mm -hmm. you know if you don't know how and no one's taught you and no one said that this is a thing even though Cosmopolitan had the word orgasm splashed all over it for decades while I was growing up there was something very violent and sort of aggressive about it and if you didn't have an orgasm you were somehow uncool and just pathetic you know and that's just and, and we don't have orgasms in the same way as men you know we don't have a thing outside that you can work on and then it's just a sort of a slightly simpler arrangement Ours are much more subtle and delicate. And have we really ever talked to, do, do we really talk about that? How do we achieve these things? That is, is, female pleasure is, is such a hidden and taboo subject still. Mm -hmm. And so for a woman in her 60s to hire a, a very much younger man to help her with this, partly because the last time she felt sexually alive was when she was 16. And so it's this experience that leads her to, to, to go back to that moment in time. And actually, in a way, Karen, it sort of does connect to you because it's, um, it's going back to an earlier version of oneself. And sometimes when you want to um, inquire about yourself, you have to go back into the past and say, well, mm -hmm. who was I then? And why yeah. did I let that get away? And yeah. um, that's partly Nancy's journey. So you know, imagining her and imagining that was my job. And um, I, I, I found her very accessible, actually. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and I imagine audiences to tune in, especially female audiences, I think will find her character really resonant because mm. I, I, it is a character. She is a character who is constantly interrogating her past versions of herself and all these mm. conversations and what she did and whether she did it right and mm. who she is and Anyway, yeah. um, you know, she I, asks I, really difficult questions. You know, she mm -hmm. says, "Why? What if? Why? Why did I bother having children? Yeah. I could have done something else." You know, these mm -hmm. are questions that are not asked because they're taboo questions. Because mm -hmm. people don't want women not to want to be mothers. Mm -hmm. Right, it's very important in our culture that we want to be nurturing, because mm -hmm. without that, everyone loses their shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Without that, there's nowhere to go. Where do you go? How do you survive without that? So it's extremely threatening mm -hmm. when a woman says, I, I'm, I'm not sure that this is for me. And, and ask any woman who haven't got children and who's thinking not having children, ask any of them. They'll say it's very difficult to have that conversation with people. They're like, why? And <clears throat> they're threatened by it. Yeah. The underlying message is almost that you've become useless as a woman. <laughs> and, mm. and it seems like Nancy is grappling with that. Uh, I want to, I want to dig into your onset experiences. Uh, first to zoom out a bit, you know, both of you have been a part of large and small productions alike. Uh, you know, Emma, you've done the Harry Potter series, Karen, you're in the Marvel cinematic universe, but these were particularly intimate sets as I understand it. Um, first of all, 
Emma, what was it like shooting this? Correct me if I'm wrong. In 19 days, in basically the same location with one scene partner for most of the film. Um, it was um, it was well intense, <laughs> really intense. The first rehearsal with wonderful Sophie Hyde, our director. Um, first of all, we knew we had 19 days, not only to learn, we, we, obviously we'd been learning it beforehand, but I mean, this is a huge two-hander where people talk a lot. So there was a great deal to learn, a great deal of, of, of work on, you know, how do we make this completely fascinating all the way through? Um, and, and, and also, how do we get to the point where we can take our clothes off and do what we have to do and deal with the nudity and deal with sex and sexuality and all of that? So our first day, I think, nearly, um, Sophie, Daryl and I rehearsed entirely nude. Um, which was amazing and talked about our bodies, talked about our relationship with our bodies, drew them, you know, um, um, discussed the things that we find difficult about, things that we like about them, described one another's bodies. It was a, it was very, it, it started with that kind of intensity and obviously had to continue in that way um, uh, until we finished. So it was, um, it was a sort of very pure experience. You know what it's like, <clears throat> Karen, when you know you're on a big film set and you're sort of there's so much stuff and there's so many cameras and there's so many people. Um, mm -hmm. Because I went on to a big movie where there was like 200, 300 on the, on the crew. And, you know, yeah. we were on a film set in a room with three people. It's amazing. And so in a way, for me, it's very it was very pure acting experience. And also it's a very pure cinema experience because it's just light and two people. Mm -hmm. um, and so from that point of view, it was it was such a precious, intense and very precious and un, um, baggy. you know, mm. you can kind of mm. feel a little bit diluted sometimes on a set when there's tons and tons of people and you can't make connections with all of them. And suddenly you're just in your little your little zone and trying to make it work, trying to make it intense enough, that sacred space where you're doing the acting Well, everyone. We had that. We shot it in Norwich in, in this very short period of time. Dara and I up in the cold mornings a year ago, trotting, walking to the studio, doing the lines, going home, sitting in <clears throat> the sofa. We would work. We called it the dog basket. We just flop down in the dog basket and do our lines over and over again for the next day and learning it in pieces. And I mean, I don't it's one of those things you look back and think, I'm not sure how we did that, but mm. um was beautiful to do. Yeah. yeah. Sounds amazing. Yeah. Karen, I wonder about your prep. Also, correct me if I'm wrong on this. I, I know you you had to go through a whole um, location change, right? Because of the pandemic. And then you spent, yeah. what, weeks working out. Uh, you know, you had this whole fitness routine, which plays into what your character uh, ends up doing. So, so with yeah. that in mind, I'd love to hear about how this uh, you know, preparation process as compared to previous projects you've done. I imagine you're not in the makeup chair for, you know, five hours putting on blue paint or anything. But... I wasn't. Oh, even <laughs> that felt like I was at the spa, to be honest, <laughs> compared to what I'm used to, which is like glue on my face in the morning. Um, but in terms of preparation, the line learning was actually pretty intense for this one because I was playing Sarah, the girl, but then also her double. And so, it, you know, I was like playing opposite myself. So there was like double the amount of lines to learn sometimes. So that, I, and, it, and also just like strangely written lines in the best possible way. So it was like, normally like logic sometimes helps you remember, but like mm -hmm. this had its own style of logic. It was, um, so that, that was a challenge within itself. Um, and then it was also interesting just because I was sort of like, I would do one side of the scene and then I would obviously change over into the other side of the scene. Um, but sometimes I would, you know, I like to just be reactive to what the other actor is giving me. But then there was some occasions where I had to be like, okay, I plan on probably doing this when I film that other side. So let me just react to that, that I'm imagining in my head so that it, the, the reaction is on this side before I get to filming the other side. Uh, but luckily I had an amazing actress who um, was from Finland. So that's where we shot it, Finland. Um, and she was really great. And she was giving me a lot to work with as well. So that was good. 
yeah, what what was your what was your major takeaway from doing that? You know, playing two, they are two different versions of the same character. And and how did you, you know, and how did you modulate how you know passive aggressive one would be or mm. versus the other? They are, they're not exactly two sides of the same coin. They they do relate. Yeah. It's hard. They're sort of two different characters in a way, but sort of created from the same pool of genes, I suppose. <laughs> like yeah. a sibling <laughs> um but like it was hard to pitch that actually I was like I actually don't know where to pitch this double clone character like is she robotic is she completely normal and human is she you know I was toying around with all sorts of things at one point I was like oh maybe she'd be really like animated but then that didn't work and um, <laughs> so we landed on like just a slightly more robotic version as if she's kind of like experiencing the world for the first time in figuring out her personality. So she's trying a few things maybe. Um, mm. And also trying to mold herself into, you know, taking over Sarah's life. But also, you know, she wants to be a better version of her and be the type of woman that Sarah's boyfriend would be attracted to and all of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of, you know, the, the things that this clone Sarah is learning, I, I, I understand that you also learned a couple new skills for, for this film, right? You're, like I mentioned, you're, you're dancing hip hop, you're also working with all these oh, yeah. different weapons opposite Aaron Paul, uh, you know, you have to differentiate between yourself and the, the evil twin. Um, mm -hmm. In this part, what is, what did you find most exciting uh, that perhaps you'd never done before? Or maybe you have done all this before and I'm just assuming. <laughs> I actually weirdly have acted opposite myself like three separate times. <laughs> I don't know why. I think it's the sci-fi of it all. Um, yeah. Because like I, I was in Doctor Who, which is all about time travel. And so you inevitably meet yourself at some point along the way. Um, uh -huh. And that happened in the Marvel movies as well. So I'm just like, is this my typecasting? <laughs> That's the weirdest one of all. <laughs> um. But no, in terms of like skills, I mean, I, I had, I, I remember like walking around with a butcher's knife, like doing all this stuff for a, a long time and everyone was like, can you stop? <laughs> uh, but it was bland. It was fine. <laughs> <laughs> no one got hurt. It's okay. No one ever got <laughs> Yeah, Emma, I'm, I'm wondering for you, you know, what about this part? Had you never um, done before that you found to be a particularly exciting challenge? Oh, yes. Um, oh, God. Well, um, it's, it's very challenging to be nude at 62, you know, um, especially in a world where um, nothing has changed in the dreadful demands made upon women in the real world world, but also in, in acting. I'm sure you find this, Karen. Um, you know, nothing's changed. You know, this thing of having to be thin is still the same as it ever was. And actually, in some ways, I think it's worse now. Mm. Um, so I don't feel that anything, I don't know, Karen, you may feel things have changed, but not my, the young actors I speak to, female actors, seem to suggest to me that it's still exactly the same, that there's still a kind of shaming going on. If you, you know, you're, yeah. get, there's, a, and you've got to lose weight and you've got to be, then I expect if you're playing a clone, you're expected to be somehow perfect. Um, and I've always felt that this was um, a kind of tyranny and also um, a way in which um, women could, again, another way of, not only making women ill, but also question themselves and lose their, their sense of themselves and lose their confidence. Um, so, you know, that's something that I've been thinking about and writing about since I was in my early twenties. And, um, and so for me, uh, uh, at the end of this film, this woman does something very extraordinary, which I've never done in my whole life. She stands in front of a mirror alone, and she drops her robe and she stands completely relaxed in front of the mirror, looking at her body, not with approval, but with no particular judgment. And um, I realized when I came to act it that it was something that I had to act because I'd never done it, that I'd never stood in front of a mirror without judging and without doing something to my body that somehow changed it so that I didn't have to look at it in the way that it was presented to me in a mirror. And this is very interesting to me because if I'm not near any mirrors, 
and I look down at my body, I'm fine. It looks great from where I'm standing. I can see my toes. Uh, everything looks like fine. It doesn't look horrible. And as soon as I look into a mirror, I see nothing but flaws. So that's an interesting thing to, to sort of experiment with, with yourself. Um, so, um, yeah, that for me was hugely, hugely difficult. And I don't think I could have done it before the age that I am. And yet, of course, the age that I am makes it extremely challenging because we aren't used to seeing untreated bodies on the screen. Yeah. We're used to seeing bodies that have been worked on, you know, for a long time to make them acceptable mm -hmm. to our eyes. And it's time that we did more to change that. Mm -hmm. It's really important that we change that. We've got to be able to see real bodies on the screen, I mm -hmm. think. I agree. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that I was given the opportunity to do that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we, we're kind of almost taught now to filter everything, right. That, that we post on, on social media, every single photo, we want to adjust our bodies, um, make ourselves look more perfect, whatever that means. Uh, Emma, I, I was hoping to dig a little bit more into that, that particular scene. I, what was the onset experience, like it, it was already so small. Was it just, was it just you? Uh, you know, what was, you know, it was it, me was and Daryl. Like? So mm -hmm. was offset, of course, by the mm -hmm. video monitor, Brian Mason, our wonderful DP um, and our wonderful focus puller, who was sort of basically an angel in human form. Um, and by the time, because we shot it in sequence, by the time we got to our nude scenes, we were very, very relaxed. We went on set at the beginning of the day. We'd take our clothes off, we'd wander around, you know, pick things up, sort of be together. The, the, the crew were very used to it, very, and it was just very closed, tiny set. Mm -hmm. um, but once you're at ease, it really doesn't matter who walks by. You don't notice it anymore, you know, because people are so, it makes you so vulnerable and yet so dignified at the same time that there's a, a, a kind of a very tender atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. I can only imagine. Uh Emma, I you want to try it. Try it. Try it the next in the cafe. Just do the whole, let's just do it in the nude. So <laughs> just say that we're going to do one nude. Come next, on. next cinema cafe just in the new pop it up <laughs> we'll get the most hits out of any oh yeah yeah <laughs> cafe be of huge. All huge. <laughs> yeah Sundance has completely changed <laughs> um and I I want to ask a little bit more about uh Daryl Emma because you, you've mentioned him a couple of times now Daryl is your well he plays Leo Grand or or he calls himself Leo Grand uh this character and this is such a pure intimate two-hander uh for the two of you um well I, I want to start by you know just asking about whether there, there there were any chemistry tests you know what was it like meeting him uh you know, and uh, and how did the two of you work together to find that particular? It's like effervescent, but slightly awkward, and but charming, charmingly so chemistry. Um, is good question. It's chem chemistry is a tricky one, isn't it? I I met um, and Daryl won't mind me saying. I mean, we met the most extraordinary array of talent for this part, um, uh, and. Uh, uh, it was a very difficult decision, you know, because there's so many wonderful, wonderful actors. And <clears throat> I just want to acknowledge them all because they were so extraordinary to me. But um, there was something about, we went for a long walk on the Heath in London, where which was very muddy at the time, and um, just slid about the Heath, sniggering. And that was very important that we could be sort of, hold on to each other and laugh. Because actually, we that's all we've done the entire time, just held on to each other, slid about and laughed. You know, that, that walk kind of was emblematic of the whole journey. And um, there was something um, not only charming and beautiful and all of those things, but very uh, curious. He's such a curious man, young man, Daryl. It's his birthday today, actually. Um, and he's 29. 
So it's, you know, it's, um, it's wonderful to have gone that year, just thinking about his, he's a remarkable performer um, because there's no, he hasn't got to get past anything, if you know what I mean. Um, he, he hasn't got to get past an, an image of himself that he needs to somehow put out into the world. So there's something as yet, I suppose, unbaked about him. Um, and that was exactly right because Leo's searching. Oh, he's really searching and he's very kind and he's incredibly curious mm -hmm. and interested in Nancy. There's nothing um, automatic about to her and indeed because she's so terrified and in such a sort of vulnerable place um you know watching him watch her and work out what it is that she might need within his professional capacity as a sex worker um was it was clear that he was going to be able to do that mm -hmm. um but you know he he, he was remarkable mm -hmm. now now karen obviously dual is not a two-hander uh despite the title, uh, but uh, you know, you, all of the scene partners you have, the way you converse, again, it's that Riley Stern's language. It is deadpan, it is straightforward, it is, it's very explicative. And, and uh, I, I wonder how did you, with your scene partners, find that rhythm and that chemistry? Because that is so different from how we talk to each other normally as human beings. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I remember working with um, Aaron Paul is also in the film and he is an incredible actor. Oh, he's so yes, he good. Is. Um, oh, so good. Um, good. He had flo just flown into Finland. I don't know if he had even managed to sleep, but he got thrown on set into a full monologue written in Riley Stern's language. Um, and he completely smashed it out the park. I was literally in awe of him. Um, he it was just a re it was a really long one too and i was like this is incredible and that sort of weirdly like just threw us into it i feel like there was no rehearsal between us either it was like he sort of did that we had like a short scene together and then we were just in it and we were doing it and, and the rhythm somehow was there i think his writing kind of does half of the job for you in a way like it's it's sort of when you read it you're like okay here here's the here's the rhythm like it sort of just appears um mm -hmm. and it's up to you to kind of deliver it in a matter of fact way. And for me, like, I think there were some instances where, you know, there was funny moments and I was trying to maybe like sell the joke or make them funnier. And he's like, just say it. Matter of fact, you're not trying to be funny. And I'm like, yes, okay, stop trying to make people laugh. And then immediately it was so much funnier. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. It's, um, I, I mean, I, I remember, I, I don't think this is a spoiler. I hope not. It's <laughs> late in the film, you you do have a really long uh, monologue where you have to explain what went wrong with a car. <laughs> and it is the- Oh yes, yes. It, <laughs> it's the strangest <laughs> monologue I've ever heard where it's like, oh, I, uh, you know, I thought the thing that you were supposed to turn is actually the thing that uh, drives the car. And I am yeah. really <laughs> curious if there was a particular monologue of Sarah's or, you know, that, that you, you you found tough to dive into because it's just not the way our brains operate. We we would not describe driving a car as pressing pedals and while you know the just one to the left of it actually moves. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually don't even know how to drive, so maybe that was more natural for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, which one moves it forward? <laughs> um, but like in terms of ch challenging monologues, I mean, I don't know if there was like one particular one that stuck out. I think that just the the overall, it was like just inserting yourself into a completely different rhythm and way of thinking and talking but then once I was in it I sort of didn't want to leave it it was like such an interesting exercise to kind of just completely flip it um and then it was like I was really in the zone and then it was maybe quite hard for me to get out of that and then do something just as a normal person so maybe maybe I'll get the back there one day <laughs> I'm I'm so glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask, you know, obviously, as we've heard, th these are both really intense roles to play. Um, how did you decompress from these roles in particular? And how do you normally as performers decompress from, you know, the, the character that you just played? Uh, Emma, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, it's a really good one, actually. Um, as a sort of person who was brought up by actors, I was sort of brought up to go, 
oh, it's fine. You just do it. You just let go. But I don't know about you, Karen, but, but I do have to decompress, actually. You do have to be a little bit careful of your buzzwords, buzzwords, mental health. Um, you know, <laughs> you really do because you can you can lose yourself a bit, can't you? Sometimes um, in a very positive way and sometimes not so much. So um, with Nancy, uh, um, actually, at the end of this, I just, I cried a lot. I cried a lot. That's how I decompressed. But actually I decompressed by having to go straight on to another movie um, in which I was playing an evil person with lots of, prosthetics on so that helped you know that helped <laughs> but yeah yeah you do have to decompress you have to decompress it's yeah. no good just going from job to job to job in the end you'll have nothing left mm -hmm. to give yeah I used to be really good at just switching off when I was like younger in my 20s I think I would just like go to work then I was like I'm home let me just watch tv I'll fall asleep had no problem sleeping uh -huh. since I've gotten into my 30s I have a way harder time sleeping, a way harder time switching off. I don't know what's happened. And like my dad would always be like, if Winston Churchill could manage to fall asleep during the war, you can sleep. <laughs> and I, was like, That's I need to talk to your father, that. Karen. Have you just <laughs> me his number and we'll just have a little chat a little about chat. it. Oh my <laughs> God. Anyway, yes. Um, but then I like, I was like, okay, I think I actually do need to take care of myself mentally. Like I need to put energy into this now. Um, it's getting to that point. And so I, you know, when I was in Finland, they, they invented the sauna in Finland, fun fact. So yes. I would get in the sauna and then go out in the cold. And then I would like also just watch the, like the trashiest reality TV I can possibly find because it just helps me switch it all off. So it was like saunas and reality TV. <laughs> Right, right combo. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a fantastic formula. I do wonder, do you, do you, do you decompress in different ways after every role or, or are you going to stick with this formula going forward, Karen? I don't always have access to a sauna. Oh, um, so I think I'm going to have to get a new one. Um, <laughs> I think it's all in the, you know, the stuff that we all know, which is let's put our phones down before bed. Let's try not to be surrounded by artificial light in our eyes. Um, mm -hmm. Take baths, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Baths are great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yes. take anything away from this conversation, take away the fact that baths are great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, I, I'm also, I'm also really curious, just going back to, you know, your, your process after uh, leaving a role, obviously after, you know, you wrap a film, you do have to end up talking about it potentially, you know, coming to a festival and seeing it for the two of you. I, are, I'm just curious, do you, uh, do you, are you comfortable watching your performances? Is that part of the letting a character go or, or are you actors who don't like seeing yourselves, um, seeing your work again? Uh, Karen, I'll start with you this time. Ooh, um, I always watch my stuff, even mm -hmm. though I don't like to sometimes if I don't like what I'm doing. If I do like what I'm doing, I'm like, this is the best. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it's, you know, you watch it and you're like, ooh, okay, that was a choice that definitely didn't work. Let me just note that down for next time. So in a way it's like, I'm watching it to kind of study it, I suppose, um, to try and get better because I guess we can't see what we're doing when we're doing it. Like, you know, like a, a, another artist might look at their painting and be like, I think I'll do that. But like, we sort of wait until it's all completely finished and then look at our work. And it's like, mm. so that's an interesting part of this this profession, I suppose. Um, and so therefore I do find it helpful to just take a look at it and, and see how I feel about it and then use that information going forward. Yeah, yeah. Emma, any any feelings one way or another? Are you a, are you also a sometimes person? Um, um, I know I'm with Karen. I, I mean, you've got to watch your work, otherwise you don't know what you've been doing. Um, <laughs> but I don't watch it again. Mm. I tend not to watch it again. And, you know, you can have a terrible experience where someone will come, come on the telly something, I'm, because I'm old now, so things come up and you look at it and go, God, that was awful. <laughs> Jesus, I hope nobody's watching that. Um, but, it, you know, it's old and it's past, so it's fine. Um, mm. So you might... Oh. 
watch it otherwise you don't know but I, what i watch themselves while they're acting you know you know that thing of go actors going to the video and watching because then you're watching yourself from the outside in and what you're actually doing is from the inside out mm. so yeah. when i first saw myself on screen um it was just a short thing i was clapping actually and i looked like a seal at, at a circus and um i decided never to watch myself Again, and I've I've stuck to that um, <laughs> pretty much. God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I I want to zoom out a, again and talk a little bit more about uh, you know overall your careers because uh, obviously the two of you are not only performers. Um, Karen, you you directed your first feature film a few years ago and have been directing shorts for a while. Um, how has your experience directing actually and, and influenced your performances since or do you keep those two separate I would say that I I just understand the the filmmaker's perspective a little bit more and it's, so it's probably just made me more supportive of the filmmaker's vision like I, I realize how you know if you want to stand a chance of having a really individual unique film that filmmaker's voice needs to be be coming through otherwise you're probably you know you might give a great performance but maybe the film is, is going to be slightly diluted or watered down in terms of the voice and so I would say it just made me even more like in support of the filmmaker like how can I serve this as best as I can while also doing what I do and, and bringing my area of expertise to the acting part um <laughs> couldn't say that seriously <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, Emma. Actually, I'm 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 interested to know. Are, are, do you have any interest in directing? You know, you you've produced, you you've, you've written, you've starred in so many films. Uh, the, you know, donning on all of those hats. Any any intention of adding one more in the director's chair? Yeah, I don't. I would like to do that. I would like to do that very much. Um, but it's got to be the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. um, I've been asked to direct a lot, but I. I go, well, there's a lot of, I mean, like Maggie Gyllenhaal just did The Lost Daughter and I spoke was speaking to her about it and she said, I've never felt so alive. And I suddenly felt deeply envious and thought, I must immediately write a film and direct it. Um, uh, I must do that right now because I want to feel that. I want to feel, I want to feel that I, I can say, I've never felt more alive. Um, it was, sort of, you know, entire, I'll never be hungry again. Um, but I... I, 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 at the moment, I haven't got that in, in my sort of immediate future, but I reckon you've got to write something that you think you're the only one who can really sort of see, see it. Mm -hmm. And because I, I, I must say, handing script over to another artistic um, lens is fantastic. It's fantastic. And, and often things are made better. Um, because and more interesting and deeper and more layered when it's handed over but it depends it depends I mean I hope so one day I would love to do it I'm very admiring of you Karen that you've done it already you should do it I, I, do, I will I'll do it <laughs> you will feel so alive <laughs> everyone will so be alive. nude everyone will be, <laughs> and there will be two of everyone one nude I'm and one clothed person. <laughs> With sort of a combination of Karen and her like dual movie and, and ours. It would be a sort <laughs> it's of- It's a naked yeah. duel. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea. If I had the power to green light anything, I would green light it right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, then looking ahead, just going back to, you know, as actors um, who have led incredibly robust careers, you, you know, what are the kinds of characters you you hope to encounter in your future as, as we wind down this conversation? I, I, I would like to know, you know, is there anything you've always wanted to sink your teeth into, whether that's, gosh, a, a genre, a, you know, a, a, a particular person, a, a, you know, Emma, I'll start with you. What's on your, what, what has always been on your wish list? I don't, I've never had a wish list. I've, mm. I think, I think it's a mistake because, um, you know, you, you, I, I just, I'm so pleased to be working. Um, so anytime I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm just very grateful. And I, obviously I would like my characters to be still alive. Um, <laughs> and it would be nice as well to, 
be working opposite men who aren't 35 years older than me um, because obviously then we'd have to exhume someone and um <laughs> and and that's been my experience as well is that what's been so nice about working with Daryl is you know working with somebody who's much younger than me I love working with young people it's just such a joy and um it, yes it would be very nice to, to make a romantic film with um someone who was much younger but that's not the point wouldn't it be just because it's taken for granted that older men will always have someone who's 35 years younger and no one gives a toss you know that would be nice to put that on the screen just for once yeah karen i i, I wonder what you think about that <laughs> about having a, a someone 30, 35 years younger than me <laughs> <laughs> or just <laughs> about, about your wish list of roles, but also, but also, sure. I don't know. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm Wait, I thought I could make them one. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to a one year old. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's hard to say it, like, to, as you're saying, like, is it the best mood to have a wish list? <laughs> because it's so dependent on so many factors. Like, you know, yeah, there's certain filmmakers I really want to work with, people with certain voices um, and, so, and, and just interesting characters. If I had to be like, OK, here's my dream role, it would probably be a serial killer. Mm. Just because mm. that would just be to like explore like why maybe. So not in like a full on horror, it would be maybe more like a psychological I don't know something like monster or something you know where you're kind of getting a more yeah. balanced view of things something mm. something really meaty and now that you've already you know yeah. gone around a set wielding a butcher's knife a, a blunt one at everyone I think you're you're getting that. yeah I'm so. ready to kill <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> well then uh you know pivoting a little bit away from that um you know Emma I <laughs> away from serial killers uh Emma I read recently that uh, Leo Grand, this film was, uh, you said it was one of the most satisfying professional experiences of your life. Um, so uh, first of all, what, what, why, why was that? I, I, I guess you've already talked about this a lot, but I am also curious about what makes a truly satisfying professional experience for you in your career. And what, what are those um, at the top of your list as you look back? Um, well, with Nancy specifically, um, it's because there's nowhere to hide because mm -hmm. this one is, um, as it were, revealed in every possible way and is revealing herself to herself as the film progresses. So she's finding things out about herself that she didn't know. She's saying things about herself she would never dare to say in front of anyone else. Mm -hmm. So um, it's an absolute X-ray of her life, her desire her passions her 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 you know it's um and there's nothing else there there's no professional role there's no masking it's very rare to play someone like that mm -hmm. she's in it she's in a room on her own with a young man she's never going to see again so it doesn't matter what she says to him when do we ever get those experiences it's very rare it's not like he's a therapist you know but is actually, it's incredibly therapeutic what happens to her. Mm -hmm. And then with, with, with regard to sort of general job satisfaction, um, I think that if you've written it and then you see, it, you've started with a piece of paper and a pen and then suddenly you're in a cinema with a load of people and that thing that you started writing is up there on the screen, there's no satisfaction comp comparable to that, I don't think. Mm, yeah, and Karen, I, I wonder for you then, what is the key to a satisfying job work experience I think when I look back at the, my favorite experiences that I've had on films I would say that the thing they have in common is that the director has a really strong sense of self and, and their voice as a filmmaker and like Jewel was really up there for me because Riley just has his thing you know and he knows exactly what he wants and so I sort of felt like I was in safe hands yet I felt enough freedom to kind of bring ideas to the table so it was a kind of nice balance um and then, you know, working on things like Guardians of the Galaxy, like with James Gunn, I would say that he also has that that thing of like, he really knows what he's doing and you can feel it. And so there's like a natural like 
you, you just feel like he is in control of the situation. And, and that's not to say that like he's controlling because he's not. He's so in control that he can sit back and let you bring what you bring to the table and encourage you to do that. Mm -hmm. um, also, I felt that on, on Jumanji too, like with Jake Kasdan, like he had a similar thing, like they just have something in common and it's just this, yeah, you just feel like, okay, they've got it. Like mm -hmm. this is going going to be okay, and I can I I feel in safe hands, and I, if they're moving on, I trust that they're moving on because they have what they need. Like it's just a nice feeling of trust. Yeah, yeah. I imagine on on set you can have so much doubt swirling around, and it's nice to have someone who mm -hmm. kind of elim eliminates all that for you as a performer. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So so to wrap up, uh, we're we're running out of time. But at the top of this interview, I, I mentioned how, at least to me, these films share some DNA in the way that they're about characters who purchase unusual services for themselves. <laughs> um, so just to wrap up. <laughs> What is, I am really curious about this. What is the weirdest thing you've ever bought for yourself out of self-care or as a gift? Uh, I'm tossing this at you. Emma, let's start with you. <laughs> ah. Wait, <laughs> oh, wait. Oh God, that's really hard. Um, a Finnish sauna. Mm. Wait, you, you bought a sauna? <laughs> yeah, up in Scotland, Karen. Oh my God. Your son is in Scotland. I, I need yes, to use this. Yes, <laughs> from your motherland. And it is Finnish. And the instructions came in bloody Finnish. Can you imagine? I mean, it was just, <laughs> how the hell are we going to get this up? You know, is that, oh, my God. Um, I, that's the first thing that's, but I'm going to think more. But um, I can't. I can't think of anything that I can actually talk about. I mean, okay. Yeah, I'm the putting you both on the spot. I've got that's been very good for my health. But <laughs> let's not yes. go there. It's your turn, Karen. For crying yeah, out. your turn. Your turn. Your turn. I'm putting you um, both on the I, spot. Weirdest thing that I've bought for self care. But I I have bought a lot of weird. But the weird part, like I. I bought one of those doctor mannequins where you can take, I'm coming across as so creepy in this interview, <laughs> talking about King, and now I'm telling you about my doctor's mannequin that you can take the organs out of. <laughs> I, oh, that's good. Where did you get that then? I think it was on Amazon, you know. Obviously. <laughs> so you but it was like, all that, like, work out where your pancreas is and everything. Yeah, I, I haven't taken it apart. I bought it more for like decoration. <laughs> because I was trying to create a creepy office for myself to like write some horror films so it's not really in the self-care section but it was there to create a certain mood which it does um <laughs> I'm regretting how I'm coming oh, I love it I love it <laughs> it's it's great I'm buying it's one I'm buying one immediately put it, put it in the sauna I'm going to I'm going to so you can take all the organs out. That's fantastic. I mean, that yeah. all works for the serial killer thing, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It totally, right. totally does. I'm doing yeah. research for my future Coming goal. together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it sounds like extreme operation. I, I fully support you, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> and you as well, Emma. Please, please, you know, just put together more Finnish saunas. <laughs> <laughs> finishing those finish saunas. Anyway, uh, on that note, uh, that's all the time we have. So I want to oh. thank you both so much for being here today. Again, Karen stars in the film Duel and Emma can be seen in Good Luck to You, Leo Grand. To tune in to more talks and events, please head to the Sundance Film Festival's virtual Main Street. Thank you all for tuning in and hope you have a wonderful rest of the fest. Thank you thank so much. Thank you. <laughs>